Hey friends, welcome back to the New Evangelicals podcast. All right, on this episode, I I really interviewed the most expert, expert person I've ever had on the show yet. I interviewed Dr. Catherine Hayho. She has a book coming out called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. Catherine is like a real legit expert, okay? Over 125 peer-reviewed climate change papers. Her stuff has been featured in congressional hearings. She is uh, one of time's 100 most influential people and the foreign policy's uh, top 100 leading global thinkers. So Dr. Hayho is, she's a boss, okay? And she knows her stuff. She's also an evangelical, which is amazing and gives me hope, um, especially considering the work that we do in the new evangelicals. So Catherine was, it was, came on, talked about her book. We talked about obviously, you know, climate change, how we know it's happening. And also how do we communicate with people who maybe don't want to hear it? How do we talk to people who are more in the climate denying camp? How do we talk to people who, the views just baffle us, right? How do we have civil dialogue and try to sway them to see things in a bigger and more beautiful way? And and Catherine's book talks about that as well as climate change, of course, and having her on was a real treat. Honestly, I'm really humbled because let's face it, I am a small tadpole in the big ocean of podcasts and Catherine came on to my podcast to talk about this book, which is just so cool. So uh, Dr. Hayho, if you're listening to this, thank you for coming on. I sincerely appreciate it. That being said, friends, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been sharing and liking and subscribing to the podcast. We continue to grow. That is humbling. I'm doing my best to get conversations started, to get guests on the podcast that hopefully make us think about the Christian tradition and how to engage our culture in a better, more Jesus-like way. So if you have any recommendations, please send them my way. I would love to hear them. Um, and of course, if you don't mind, if you could just give us a rating and a review and share this episode, it helps get the word out. You know, one of the big things for New Evangelicals is that we know that there are millions of people in this space who are looking for places and communities like ours. So sending out these podcasts, sharing about the New Evangelicals, you know, and what we're doing helps let people know that, that they're not alone, which is amazing to me. Um, and that we are a safe place for people who are trying to deconstruct their faith, understand their faith, and go deeper in their faith. So thank you so much. Hey, one more thing I want to say, and then I'll, I'll get over to Catherine's interview is a pretty big news. So one of our goals and funding for the Finding Our Voices campaign is to get to a place of $6,500 a month, okay? And that would, that would let us be able to do the docu-series. It would allow me to do this full time and it would give us a working budget to cover overhead. We are at $2,000 a month in regular monthly funding, which is huge because that means that we're halfway to the point where I can actually pour all of my time and energy into new evangelicals, which is a big deal because there are so many things that we want to get done that I just don't have the time to do. That includes doing more Zoom groups. That includes working on building better networks, on working on uh, on ways to give people free resources to navigate deconstruction and the evangelical church and, and how to navigate all those tricky waters. So thank you to everyone who has been giving. We are currently in the process of forming the nonprofit, which means that all of your donations are going to be tax deductible very soon. If you want to give, you can click on the link uh, in the show notes that kind of explains what we're doing while we're doing it. All of the money goes right into New Evangelicals, and I appreciate that so much. I live and breathe this community. This is all I think about all day. And the sooner I can do this full time and pour all of my energy into what we're doing here, the better off this is going to be. So I appreciate everyone who is doing that. All right, listen, without further ado, friends, here is my interview with Catherine. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Catherine, thank you for making time out of your busy schedule. As I'm reading your book, which I have here, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, I, I, as I'm reading, I'm like, wow, you travel everywhere talking about climate change. Like You are a leading authority. So I'm honored to have you on. Thanks for making time. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is one of those conversations where it's like, man, so much to get to, but one thing at a time, I have to pace myself. So let's start here. Why don't you give us your background? Like, how were you raised? Um, are you in the evangelical world? And then how did you get into climate, um, you know, science work? Absolutely. So I grew up with the perspective that I thought was totally normal at the time. And now I realize how unusual it is. And I wish everybody could have this, which is that my dad was a science teacher and was also an elder, a teaching elder in our local church. Wow. 
So I grew up in the Plymouth Brethren denomination. It's I know not- Plymouth Brethren. Oh, you do? You do? Yes. Head coverings. <laughs> yes. I have a friend who's who, who's in the Plymouth Brethren. No, I w- I've been in their meetings before. Oh, my, exactly. Meetings, not churches, meetings. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you do know. So that's what I grew up on. It's wow. very, it's a very popular denomination in Canada and in Europe. It was a breakaway of the Anglican church back in the day. Uh, uh. Um, and the whole idea is that you sort of go back to the Bible and whatever it says is what you do. That's right. So there's some things that are very sort of, we would see as archaic today, like the whole head covering thing. Yeah. But the thing that I really appreciated in my, you know, in my Christian foundation, Christian, you know, uh, in gr- growing up in that was the idea that it's all about looking at the Bible yourself. It's about asking questions and looking yeah. for the answers yourself. It's not about showing up on Sunday and listening to what somebody spoon feeds you. Mm. It's about actually asking the questions and going out and trying to find the answers to them. Yeah. And I wish that we had more of that. I feel like in the church today, because if we did, I don't think we'd be in the position that we're in. Mm. Mm. So no denomination is perfect. And today I go to a non-denominational evangelical church where my husband is actually the pastor of the church. So I'm the pastor's wife too. Oh my goodness. (laughs) You wear a lot of hats. I do. Well, not only that, but when I was um, nine years old, my dad packed up the family and we actually moved down to Colombia in South America, where he and my mom served as missionaries for a number of years. Whoa. So, so wow. it's, it's kind of wow. the whole thing, yeah. but I grew up with this perspective that if we truly believe that God created this universe that we live in, which is yeah. what we as Christians believe, right? then what is science other than trying to figure out what God was thinking when he put the whole thing together in the first place? Right, right. So you grew up immediately knowing that faith and science are not intention, which is not how most of us grow up with, you know, thinking about it. Exactly. In fact, they can't be intention. Mm. If you believe that the Bible and the universe were created by the same person, they literally Mm. cannot be intention. So why do they sometimes appear to be intention? Yeah, It's because of us, Mm. our limited understanding of the Bible through our very, very thick cultural lenses that we read it through. And of course, our limited understanding of science, which is constantly improving over time as we learn more and more. And in some cases, the two end up being reconciled with each other within our lifetimes. In some cases, I feel like there might be some things where we're never going to know until we get to heaven. I have a long list of questions (laughs) for when that happens. (laughs) Sure. Absolutely. But it's the whole attitude of if there appears to be a conflict, it's got to be a lack of our understanding. It's not a fundamental difference between the two halves of God's creation. Yeah. Wow. I love that. That's great. So, so is it your dad who got you into science then? Is that what made you want to pursue, you know, especially climate science? Well, yeah, it's hard when you're being brought up by someone who loves science so much that every summer you have a new project, like it's the wildflowers of Ontario or identifying bird calls or, you know, one of my first memories is going to the park when I was just probably like three years old and it felt like it was like two in the morning, but it was probably like nine o'clock at night. Right, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and he was showing me how to find the galaxy Andromeda through binoculars. Oh my goodness. Whenever we went on family trips, our family trips were literally planned around astronomical events. Wow. Like we would go down to visit friends in the Outer Banks when Haley's Comet was there, or my dad would plan a trip around, you know, seeing a solar eclipse or something like that. Wow. And so we, ha- we had this big station wagon because we always had a telescope that went with us on all our family vacations. And I shouldn't say went, it still goes. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, so you, you get into, I guess, the study of science. At one point where you like climate. I need, this is right. This is my wheelhouse studying the climate. Like, like what was that shift for you? Like, well, it was a very abrupt shift Hmm. because I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Hmm. I wanted to study the universe. I think it is just amazing that using nothing more than our brains and whatever we can build on this relatively insignificant planet that we can study the edges of the known universe. Yeah. Um, and my dad's passion too, is astronomy. I mean, he would have back in the days when you had slides, you know, like carousels of slides. Yes. Yes. He would have these slideshows that he would take around to Christian camps and conferences and churches um, to show people what he called God's art gallery, which wow. are the nebula and the constellations and the star clusters. And I mean, it is just amazing that you are laying eyes. We are laying eyes today on things that nobody except God has seen. Right. I mean, that just blows your mind. But right. you know that God created it knowing that we would see it. Right. And, you know, you kind of have the sense that God's sort of sitting there going, oh, this is so gorgeous. I can't wait till they finally see this. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and then we see that. it and we're like, whoa. Right. Yeah, it is. It, it is like it's stuff out of movies, right? You see it and you're totally. like, it's surreal, but it exists. It's it's somewhere right now. You know, it's it, it's existing. It's very it's very hard to wrap my, my, my mind around it, honestly. 
it sort of gives me chills to think about it. <laughs> yeah. So why the shift then into climate change? Well, so, so I was, um, you know, I grew up as a missionary kid and my uncle was a missionary doctor in Africa. And so I sort of had the sense of, you know, um, if, if you're, if you're right in the middle of like God's perfect plan for your life, you're in Christian service. So, you know, you're a missionary or you're a yes. medical doctor or you're a pastor or a minister right. or something, but I never really felt called in that direction. I, I didn't feel like those weren't my skills. Those weren't, those weren't my abilities. So I felt mm. like, okay, so I'm sort of in the second best ring <laughs> where I'm using the brain that God gave me to study his creation. And right. maybe there'll be some positive benefits for people down the line. Cause you know, all these discoveries that NASA makes now helps us in our everyday life. Maybe a silver crown in heaven, not the gold one. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Right. Maybe like a single chain and not the full <laughs> Mr. T starter right, set. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and literally, well, so speaking of the Plymouth Brethren, there sure. are many good things about them, but also many bad things. And some of the bad things are is that they tend to quibble over some very insignificant things. <laughs> and one historic fight that divided the denomination before I was born was whether when you get to heaven, everybody gets the same size cup of joy, but with different amounts of joy in it, or whether everybody's cup is full, but they're different size cups. No. Yes. <laughs> they had like 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 a, a major denominational fight over that? Yes. There was also another one over whether we are saved by all of Jesus' blood or only the blood that came out his side when he was pierced by the spear. What? The, who yes. thinks of this? <laughs> I know. Normally it's just the color of the carpet that divides people. I, mean, you know. I have never thought about that ever. And this denomination is like, you know, risking a, a, a full split over that issue. Wow. Yes. I, I feel like, like I have to have you back on just to talk about the, the Plymouth Brethren at one point, because there's so much we can go into there. <laughs> oh, we could. And, and the fact that their founder, John Nelson Darby, is single-handedly responsible for the dispensationalism that has led to the whole apocalyptic, you know, left behind and all yes. of the- The world's you know, going to burn- Yes, the beast will roar in 84 and all of those sort of yes. things that went on. Yes. He's the one who started that whole thing. Yeah, I, I'll have to get you back on at some point. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, that has to, it's it's almost, it is a little interesting to me that, that that the church you grew up in has this founder who starts this kind of idea that takes off, obviously. And a lot of it is also what's used to to not take climate change seriously, right? Like, like, like oh, Full well, circle. it's all going to burn. And yep. here you are, like, you know, no. And also <laughs> you're a woman, right? So it's like extra, like, dagger in the side. Like, I, not only that, I'm going to, I'm going to stop this whole thing. So I love that. I think that, I think that the, it's just poetic justice, you know, in, in, it in a totally lot of ways. It totally is. What I goes love. around comes around. <laughs> All right. So, so okay. you're going to study, um, you're going to be an astrophysicist, but then what happens? All right. So here, here I am studying yeah. astrophysics and I need an extra class to finish my undergrad degree. And by then I had gone back to Canada. I was at the university of Toronto um, and studying galaxy clustering around quasars, which is really awesome. And I looked around and there was this brand new class over in the geography department on climate science. So I thought, well, that looks really interesting. I had learned about climate change along with other environmental issues mm. like deforestation, biodiversity loss, air pollution. Mm. And growing up in Canada, everybody knows climate change is real, but mm. we sort of mentally, at least I back then, and I think most people still, we mentally lump it as one more environmental issue that environmentalists are going to take care of. Yes. Like Jane Goodall and David Attenborough and in Canada, David Suzuki, they're going to take care of that stuff for us. And the rest right. of us wish them well. And we watch their documentaries. Right. We're, I'm cheering you on. That That is me. I mean, I'm like, like someone will take care of it, right? Like someone's yeah. working on this out there. That's exactly what I thought. And I thought, you know, not me. So, so I take this class and I was completely shocked for three reasons. Okay. The first surprise was that climate science was the exact same physics that I've been learning in my physics and astronomy classes. Mm. I don't know what I thought it was, but I didn't think it was that. Right. The second surprise was that climate change is urgent. It is not a future issue anymore. It's not just happening over there or in the future. It's now and it's here. And the window of time to fix it is closing fast. So hmm. that was a shocker. But the surprise that changed my life was when I found out that climate change is not only an environmental issue. Climate change affects our health. It affects the economy. It affects national security. It affects literally the food that we eat and the water we drink. And most of all, it affects the poor more than anyone else. 
people mm -hmm. who are already marginalized and vulnerable right here in North America, as well as on the other side of the world, the people who have done the least to contribute to the problem, yeah. they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of the impacts. The 10% richest people in the world have produced 50% of the heat trapping gas emissions that are causing climate change. The poorest 3.5 billion people have produced 10% of the problem. And that is not fair. Mm. And growing up as, a, mm. as an MK, I know, right. I knew what poverty looked like. It doesn't look like a lot of what we see here in North America. It looks like, you know, living in a home that is made of tied cardboard boxes you rescued from the garbage collection. And, you know, all your family works all day. And everyone past the age of 12 goes out and works to buy bricks. And mm. when you have enough bricks, you build one room for your family with six children. You have a party and you invite everybody you know because you have one room that's made out of bricks mm. so that when the rain falls, your house isn't going to get swept away. Mm. I mean, that's what poverty looks like. And those are the very same people who are most affected as wildfire burns more area and hurricanes get stronger and heavy downpours increase and crop losses increase because you know of, of heat waves and droughts. So I thought to myself, I thought, how can I not, given that I serendipitously, of course there's no real accidents, but <laughs> I serendipitously have the exact skill set you need to study this. Mm. How can I not do everything I can to help fix this urgent problem. And after I'm done, then I can go back to astrophysics. Hmm. And I hate to tell you how long ago that was. It was nowhere near the time horizon I thought it was going to be. But here's the really interesting thing. Over time, my perspective on what I'm doing has completely changed because now it really is. I mean, I know that footsteps poem that we all know, and you know, you look back yes, in your life yes, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But if, if you look back, if I look back, back, yes, I, I really feel like, um, that I see like the two sets of footprints. I feel like everything that's happened to me and everything I'm, I'm doing, it's not like the second best of what God wanted me to do. Mm. It's right in the middle. Mm. Um, I feel like every step of the way I've been able to just put my foot into the good works that he already prepared for me in advance. Mm -hmm. And I'm just literally walking in the steps that he's prepared in so many ways, so many choices, so many things that have happened. I never planned any of it. All I planned was just the one step ahead. Mm. And I think that sort of fits because, you know, we're always told a five-year plan for your life, a 10-year plan, a 20-year right. plan, Right. but the Bible's very clear, you know, don't worry about the past because you can't change it. And don't worry about the future because I've got it. Hmm. And so just here you are right here, right now. And what's your next step forward? And that's yeah. the way I've lived for the last 20 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. What, what a story. I love that. Let's get into your book. Um, I got an advanced copy. I feel very, you know, very fortunate, you know, to have gotten it. And I, I, I have like one or two chapters left. It's really a phenomenal read. Um, there's so much to talk about. And I feel like there are two things you're trying to point out in this book and tell me if I'm wrong. The first thing is that climate change is real. It's primarily man-made. and It's a problem that we have to fix. Like that's like, you know, that is the idea, but also you have this other really important point in the book, which is like, but how do we talk to people who maybe don't want to hear it or think that this is a political issue, even though it's really not. And how do we build bridges and not keep the cycle going? Um, are those the, the two main points of the book? Because that, that, that's what I got out of it. Yeah, I would add one more. And I think you sort of already mentioned that, which is there are solutions. Solutions, yes. Yeah, we can fix it. And talking about it is the first way that each of us can be part of those solutions because we're not talking about it. Most people in the US never hear anybody talk about this issue. And if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever want to do anything to fix it or vote for politicians who fix it or ask people at the place where we work or our school or our church, what are we going to do to help? We're never going to do any of that if we don't think it matters. And if we don't, if we never talk about it. Yeah. Why would we think it matters? So let's start here. Um, let's start with this. You know, why don't you kind of give us a very, as brief as you can, crash course on how we know that not only is the climate uh, changing and warming, but also it's primarily man-made. It's not just a normal occurrence. I know you talk about it in your book a little bit. And the reason why I asked that is because, again, I grew up um, in a Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, mm -hmm. you know, household. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then they go, oh, a new study came out proving that the climate really isn't warming how we thought, or, you know, uh, uh, Al Gore's um, documentary never really came true, et cetera, you know? So, mm -hmm. so why don't you kind of bring us through, like, what's the data that, 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 you know, and, and how do we know that things are changing that we're really causing it? Exactly. Well, that is the number one objection that people have is that it's just a natural cycle, right? Yeah. Like that's literally number one, right? I scratched myself on my forehead too. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. It looks fine. Okay. 
Um, yeah. I can't edit that out. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough at video, but you look totally fine. So. All right. So everybody gets that. It's all the video and all the speaking too. It shows I'm human. You scratch me and I actually do bleed. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and it's red too. Yes. Um, so that is the number one question. And in fact, you know how I know it's number one is because, um, have you read the story yet about John and his dad and the solar panels? Have you got to that part Yes, yet in the book? I got to that part. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I love that story. That's a great story. Yes. It's probably one of my favorites. And John's a Christian too, by the way. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so John is, created this website called skepticalscience.com because every time he would go home for dinner, his dad would be like, well, John, there's more polar bears now than there ever were. So how can you say they're in danger? <laughs> right. Um, so John being a scientist goes through and he collects every argument. I think he's up to 198 of them and he organizes them by how frequent they are. And the number one argument is it's just a natural cycle. It's happened before. It's been warmer before. So right. why does this matter? Exactly. And skeptical science is awesome because they have detailed answers to every single one of those 198 objections. I'll plug them in my show notes. Skepticalscience.com. But here's what people don't realize. What they don't realize is how do we know it's been warmer before? Because climate scientists are the ones who study that. Mm. We are the ones who study. And in fact, if I had to guess, I think we spend a lot more of our time studying natural variability than we do studying humans. Because natural huh. variability is more complex, and more interesting, scientifically speaking. <laughs> we are mm. the ones who found out and told people that it was warmer before. So when we see it getting warmer today, we don't just immediately jump on the Al Gore bandwagon and start screaming, it's got to be humans. You know, that would be the equivalent of if you were running a low grade fever and you go in to see your physician and the physician takes one look at you without running any tests and screams Ebola. And mm. then these people in hazmat suits run in and like bundle you up and take you off, you know, <laughs> right, like, right. That's the equivalent, the medical equivalent of saying, oh, it's warming. It must be humans. Mm. No. Okay. What, we, what, what does a good doctor do? First of all, they run a bunch of tests. They yeah. eliminate all the common things. Like, could it be a fever? Could it be the cold? cold? Could it be, you know, food poisoning? Could it be COVID these days? Right. You know, what, what could it be that's normal right. before they, they go for what they call the zebra diagnosis? The zebra is like the rare diagnosis. Ah, okay. I learned that from talking to a physician recently. Interesting. The zebra yes. diagnosis. If I the hear that, diagnosis. I'll start panicking. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should. Because <laughs> you're the zebra. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <It's you. laughs> um, so, so what we do is we say, okay, could it be all of the other natural suspects? And I go through this very briefly in the book because it's important yeah. to know that we've done this. Yeah. The biggest reason why climate has changed in the past is because of changes in energy from the sun. The sun it's like a dimmer switch on a lamp. You turn mm. it up, it gets brighter, we get a little warmer. Turn it down, a little less energy, we get cooler. So when we look at the sun, what do we see? We see that over the past 50 years, the energy from the sun has been going down, mm. not up. Mm. So if it were being controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler not warmer. Hmm. Then people say, okay, but what about volcanoes? Doesn't one volcanic eruption produce more pollution than all humans do in, you know, a year or 10 years or 30 years? Right. No. Volcanic eruptions actually cool the earth down for a, a couple of weeks to maybe a year because they put all these particles into the upper atmosphere that reflect the sun's energy back to space like an umbrella. Hmm. And, you know, in hot countries, sometimes people walk around with parasols right? That's yep. where parasol comes from for yes. the sun right. to reflect the sun's energy off them so they don't get so warm. So we know the volcanic eruptions temporarily cool the earth a little bit, but we know that all the heat trapping gases from all volcanic activity and all geologic activity around the whole earth add up to the equivalent of three medium-sized states. Hmm. So there's no way that that's right. what's causing our warmth. It doesn't add up. No. So then people say, okay, well, what about natural cycles? And then right. when they say that, I'm like, well, what natural cycles are you talking about? And then mm. people are like, well, I don't know, natural cycles. <laughs> right, yeah, you know, nat natural cycles. Aren't you no a scientist? You know? <laughs> right. But it turns out there's two kinds of natural cycles. Mm, okay. One of them is outside the earth and the other one's inside the earth's climate system. Hmm. So the one outside the earth's climate system are called orbital cycles. And I actually learned about them in my astronomy classes before I even took climate science. Wow. Over time, the earth's um, uh, orbit becomes more elliptical and then more circular. Okay. And then also, you know how the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees relative yeah. to the plane of the orbit. And we spin really quickly once a day. That's right. why we have 24 right. hour days. But, you know, if you take a wooden top, like a child's top and you spin it, it goes around really quickly, but it also goes around slowly like this. And that's called precession. Oh. And so the earth does that too. Interesting. It processes slowly over tens of thousands of years, as well as spinning really quickly once a day. So what that does is it changes how sunlight falls on the earth. 
Because if we were all ocean, it wouldn't matter. If we were all ice, it wouldn't matter. But we have ocean here, land here, ice here, mm. and that absorbs different amounts of the sun's energy. Yeah. So these orbital cycles, it turns out, are what trigger the ice ages and the warm periods like we're in today. They okay. trigger it. Okay. So where are we on that cycle? Right. Are we just getting warmer after the last ice age? Everybody's seen those ice age movies with the rodent, with the totally. bat, with, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know They're what hilarious. I'm talking about? Yeah, yes. of course. I, I mean, whenever you say ice age, I think of the movie ice age. Like that's how good their marketing was, you know, like. Totally. <laughs> I know I even do. And I'm a scientist. I immediately think of like the, the woolly mammoth totally. and the rodent yeah, and the yeah. acorn. <laughs> the acorn. That's yes. a stupid acorn, you know. <laughs> I know. That's my favorite part. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so where are we on that cycle? Yeah. Well, you can calculate it from mathematics because it's just, you know, orbital mechanics. And it turns out that our warming peaked about six to 8,000 years ago. And on that cycle, we're on the slow, slow, slow slide into the next ice age. So we should now, be cooling. We should be cooling, not warming. And according to the sun, we should be cooling, not warming too. And according to volcanic eruptions, they should cool us down, not warming us too. Hmm. But then there's one more type of natural cycle that's inside the climate system. Okay. And these are natural cycles like El Nino. Most okay. people have heard of El Nino or La Nina. Yeah. And what these cycles do is they are simply a way of rebalancing the planet's energy. So they move energy from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again, or from east to west or from north to south to sort of, they're always trying to rebalance it. So we aren't too cold in one place and too hot in another. And that fascinating. I never knew it that. is. It's oh, it's, it's part of the incredible balance of the earth. Like studying the earth. You're just like, this is genius. Who designed this thing? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you're like, oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have all these sort of checks and balances built into the earth system to keep the earth pretty stable because otherwise we wouldn't be able to really have life on earth. Right. So what these cycles do is when we have an El Nino, it's usually, um, a little rainier than normal where I live, a little cooler than normal. When we have a La Nina, it's a little warmer than normal, a little drier than normal. Right. Because they're moving heat around the Earth system. So if the atmosphere were getting warmer, but the heat content of the ocean were going down, it would be a natural cycle. Heat's going from the ocean into the atmosphere. That's right. a natural cycle. Right. But if the whole planet is warming, if the atmosphere is warming and the ocean's warming and the cryosphere, that's the ice, if that's warming too, if the whole thing is warming, well, the cryosphere doesn't warm, it just melts. Right, it melts. <laughs> so if it's, right. if it's melting, then it's not a natural cycle because it can't just create heat out of nowhere. It can't create energy out of nowhere. That would violate conservation of energy. Hmm. It would violate the fundamental, one of the fundamental laws of the universe. Right. And that's exactly what's happening. The atmosphere is heating up, but the ocean's heating up even more. 20 times more heat is going into the ocean than the atmosphere. So we, we systematically cross off all the natural suspects and mm. every single one of them has an alibi. We should be getting cooler right now due to natural factors. And instead we're warming faster and faster. And that's how we know to go for the zebra diagnosis or so zebra, as we would say. <laughs> so essentially what you're telling me is that you're not just some liberal Marxist radical who's going around like, you know what? We need to control people. So the planet's warming because we just made it up and we want to we, we want to control if you can have two paper bags or one plastic bag or whatever else it is. You're saying that, that as a scientist, you actually take the time and think about this as objectively as humanly possible to go through and say, OK, let's look at the most common reasons that our planet could be warming. And you go, OK, it's not that. And then when, when all the common, you know, diagnoses are off, but this is almost like, you're almost like house at this point, right? Your yeah, patient totally. has, has a mystery diagnosis. Yes. You have ruled out all the common ones. And now you're looking for the real weird one. And through your study, what have you found? Well, according to a lot of people on Twitter, I am exactly what you first said. <laughs> How <did> I know. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you get some of the same people on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but no, you're right. That's exactly what we do. And in fact, I had one colleague, Bruce Anderson, who he even said, and this was genius. He said, what if it's something we don't know about? Hmm. What if there's literally some unknown factor? And we've already right. checked. We've checked cosmic rays and galactic rays and the Earth's heat. We've checked all those too. But he even asked, what if there's some unknown factor? And he determined that even if there's some unknown factor, that it could be responsible for at the very most 20% of the problem. At hmm. the very most, no more. Okay. Okay. So where do we look now? Yeah. Well, 
this is not new science. A lot of people think, oh, well, you just figured this out recently. Like, when, you know, around about when Al Gore decided to make his movie, he right. went to the scientist, he's like, make me some slides. Right, I'll pay you some <laughs> right. money, get this done, right. you know? Right, right. Um, but what happened was back in the 1800s, hmm. when the Industrial Revolution had kicked off, people were burning lots of coal back then. Yeah. There were some really smart scientists back in the 1800s hmm. who already started to put the pieces together. Hmm. So in the 1850s, there was an Irish scientist named John Tyndale who actually built the scientific instruments that he needed to measure the fact that gases trapped heat. Okay. And specifically carbon dioxide, which is what we produce when we um, you know, burn coal or gas or oil. And then methane, which is what natural gas is. It's mm. pretty much all methane. Right. Those are two of the primary heat trapping gases. And he actually measured how much heat they trap. And then on the other side of the ocean in upstate New York, so not far from where I grew up in Toronto, mm. there was a woman called Eunice Foote. Actually, her name was Eunice Newton Foote. Oh. And she was a distant cousin of Sir Isaac Newton. Wow. Being a woman, she did not get to have a university degree back then in the 1850s. Right. But she got to go to a, a woman's school, a girl's high school that had a chemistry lab which back in those days, I mean, there's probably one in the whole country. Right. So she got to go there and she learned the basics of, of how to do chemical experiments. And so after she got married, her husband was really interested in science too. So she built a lab, like literally in her backyard. Wow. And she did things like putting different gases, like CO2 into glass tubes and measuring how much their temperature changed if you expose them to the sun or to wow. other types of energy. And so she wrote a paper in 1856 where she literally said, if carbon dioxide levels were higher at any time in the planet's history, the planet would be warmer. Hmm. Does that not blow your mind? Wow, like a prophet. <laughs> Totally, exactly. And then in the 1890s, there was a really smart Swedish scientist called Svante Arrhenius, and his mother's name was Carolyn Thunberg. And Thunberg is also the last name of Greta Thunberg. Yes, that name sounds familiar. Distant cousins also. Isn't wow. that interesting? Yeah, it is yes. interesting. Um, I haven't figured out who John Tindall's related to yet, but I'll find somebody. <laughs> Um, anyway, so Arrhenius was um, over here winning a Nobel Prize for his work in analytical chemistry, but because he was a scientist, he just loves to do science for fun. So he decided for fun <laughs> that he was going to calculate how much every latitude band of the planet, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, how much each latitude band of the planet would warm if carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels increased by 50% or doubled or tripled or quadrupled. So he sat down and calculated those numbers by hand. It was the very first climate model for fun. It took him two years. Around about Christmas, the first year, his wife packed up the family and left. Oh, oh which boy. I take very personally because I do climate modeling myself, yeah. but I use computers. <laughs> and I must admit that after dinner, I do sneak up to my computer and check to make sure all my simulations are still running, but I just check. I don't sit on it. I'm sure you do. Yeah, yes. just check. <laughs> right. Once in a while, the family might have to call for me, but most of the time I just sort of pop up and pop down again. But anyways, I mean, so this is crazy. So we knew that burning coal back then and oil and gas today produces heat trapping gases. We knew that they were building up in the atmosphere. We knew exactly how much the planet would warm depending on how much we burned. And then by the 1830s, a British engineer called Guy Callender, who was born in Canada. So I'm going to claim him too. All your... He, in his spare time between yeah. working on like weapons for the British government, in World War I, yeah. he actually collected weather station data from all around the world, added it all up and showed that the planet was indeed warming because of burning fossil fuels in the 1930s. This is how long we have known that digging up and burning coal and gas and oil produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the, in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like you would if someone snuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on you that you didn't oh, need. God. God. Yeah, exactly. I, That's I, what's happening. I already to run hot. I don't need any more blankets on me. 100%. Yes. Okay. So, so this is not new. We've known this for a while. And yet here we are in 2021 in specifically America, you know, where, where climate denial is, is very prominent. I mean, I, I would say it's, a, it's very common and at, at a minimum, it's a, yeah, like it probably is warming, but you know, someone's taking care of it kind of attitude. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have people like you who are like pretty much sounding the alarm saying, Hey, um, guys, this is way worse than, than we realize. Um, and if we don't do something about it, we're in a lot of trouble. So 
you know, I think this would be a good time to kind of segue a little bit into how do you have these conversations? Like, like in your book, you talk about how you talk to, you know, fossil fuel executives and how you've actually won them over, um, you know, and had, and really showed them that like, Hey, maybe there's a way going forward. What does it look like trying to have this conversation? Can you, before you do that, can you also explain in your book, how you kind of label different types of people? I think from, I think it's like a scale of like one to five with, with like different names. Yes. So, so in the book, I talk about how I really don't like the words that people usually use, which are believers and deniers. Right. I don't like believers because it makes it seem like climate change is some kind of religion that you have to believe in. Hmm. Whereas in fact, all we're doing is we're using the sound mind that God gave us to look at what his creation is telling us. Right. That's not a religion. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. You're just reading the the temperature literally on the patient saying, here it is. Exactly. And and the thermometer does not give you a different answer depending on how you vote or even what you believe in or don't. Right. 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 So I don't like believers for that. And I also don't like it because often people who are opponents of climate action have deliberately framed it as a earth worshiping religion. Yes. And they do that because they know that those of us who are true believers, we know if a false prophet comes knocking what to do, right? We know we are not going to give them, you know, the time of day. Well, and you, so, would, you would think, okay, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Oh, I know. I, say, you would think, we I would know, think that would happen. One so, would think that, yes. I, I just want to put yes. that in for my audience. Audience, I hear you. I know what you're saying. And we, we would think that would happen. But all right, yes. go ahead. I'm no, no. You're, you're totally right. And I think we could have a whole different discussion on how people have listened to false prophets. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but, but, and I'm sorry to say politicians are, are some yeah. of the ones who do this in the biggest way in the US. They say, oh, climate change isn't, isn't science, it's religion. And they do it that way because they know that then Christians would be like, oh, it's religion. Well, it's not my religion. Well, then right. I'm going to reject it. Right. So they do it as a way to very cynically get people to reject what God's creation is telling us. Right. But I don't like the word denier either because it's, you're drawing a line in the sand and you're immediately saying that that person is on par with the lowest, you know, Holocaust denier, the lowest, whatever, whatever that you can think of. And often what I found is most people have questions and they're afraid to ask their question because as soon as they ask a question, they'll be smacked with a denier label. and Nobody likes that. Mm, Right. Totally. No. So instead I prefer um, something called the six Americas of global warming Mm. that I didn't invent it. Um, It was created by these smart guys at Yale university. Um, And they showed that people actually fall into six groups and the two biggest groups, this is crazy, Mm. are alarmed and concerned. Those are the two biggest groups. More than 50% of us are alarmed or concerned about climate change in the U S wow. And it's bigger in other countries, quite significantly bigger. Sure. So over 50% of us are already either alarmed or concerned about climate change, the first two groups. And then there's a, uh, the next biggest group is cautious. So we think there's something there. Mm. We're sort of a bit worried, but we've heard a lot of conflicting information. We don't know what to believe. And cautious right. people are often mistaken as deniers because they lead with their doubts, which makes sense, right? You lead right. with your questions, but they're leading with them because they really want answers to them. Right. And that's, that's where it's different. So after cautious come the three smaller groups. First of all, there's a small group of people who are disengaged. They've been living under a rock the last 20 years. (laughs) There are a few of those people around. And then there's a larger group, 12% that are doubtful. They're pretty, pretty hardcore. They have very serious doubts. Mm. They listen a lot to like the talk shows on AM radio and they read the blogs and they're, they're pretty sure it's not real, but they're, you know, they're willing to engage a little bit as long as you don't smack a denier label on their forehead immediately. Right. But then you have the seven percenters. Mm. The seven percenters at the very end are what they call dismissive. And I think that that's the perfect name because they will dismiss anything. They will dismiss 200 years of science. They'll dismiss, you know, 50 feet of, of, of scientific reports stacked up past the the roof of the house. Right. They'll dismiss thousands of scientists. They will dismiss everything because to them, asking them to change their minds on climate change is almost like asking them to remove or amputate a body part. Like that's how much part of it it is. Right. So when people say, you know, how do you have a conversation or I want to have a conversation nine times out of 10, they want to have a conversation with the one person in their life, or maybe two Mm. who is a dismissive uncle Joe, their old college roommate, the guy, you know, next to them at work. Why? Because dismissives talk about climate change all the time. They cannot leave it alone. It's like a sore tooth. It's like Don's dad. They have to bring it up all the time and everything they say is wrong usually. And so you just really want to show them. You just want to show them that they're wrong. Right, right. And unfortunately, like I say in the book, dismissives are the only group that I don't think we can have a constructive conversation with outside of a true miracle happening. 
I appreciate that because I often wrestle with this dismissive type in my own circles, right? Mm-hmm. These are the people who would say the election was stolen, people who are convinced that, you know, to get the vaccine is to get the mark of the beast, people that no matter how many studies you put in front of them will Google and find one study that will then disprove the thousands of studies that are out there, right? And it's it's tough because I really am not in the business of dehumanizing people. And I think that to be Jesus-centered is to is to be humanizing, even people that that really you have a hard time, you know, dealing with, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time, though, it does seem like there is a portion of the population in America, and, and now it's being exported to other parts of the world. It is um, that are very much in in a. I, I don't know the right word, and if they're listening, I don't want to offend them, but almost like like a cult like state of mind where it's just so mm-hmm. narrow that no amount of information will convince them. Otherwise, and anything that could possibly be spun to fit their narrative will be the next big thing. And so it's interesting to see that even in that this idea of dismissive is certainly in the climate you know, change you know, um, audience, but it, it really expands. And I think and I I'm not going to make you say it. I'm going to say it. But if I was a, a betting person. I think the connection is evangelical culture. I think that most of these dismissives, not all, but I would sure I would sure as bet that most have some kind of God and country foundational belief and probably attend some form of an evangelical church, whether it's a non-denominational or it's Baptist or it's a, you know AG, whatever it is. I just I have, I, I have no proof, but if I was a betting man, I bet a lot of money on that. Okay, well, I, I would put my bet slightly different than yours. Ooh, related, related. I love this. Okay, okay, go ahead. Um, so first of all, you are absolutely right that climate denial is part of a toxic stew. It mm. is very rare, and I get attacked on social media daily, sometimes often multiple times a day. Yeah. And I get letters, and I get phone calls, and I get everything. Before I do that, before I block anybody on social media, I look at their profile, because I want to mm. know who is going right. to look up somebody they don't know and just like call them a whore or tell them they're an idiot or whatever. And so it is very rare to see pure climate denial with nothing else there. Most of the time there is, it's anti-vax, anti-mask, yep. often a bit of red pill or QAnon thrown in there, a little sprinkle of that. There's right. definitely uh, rampant nationalism. Trump definitely won the election. Yep. Biden is the son of the devil. Right. Um, and it all goes together. And there's also, oh, there's also some guns in there too. Of course. Yes. So, so that all goes together. And I completely agree with you on that. Mm. And also I would say probably maybe eight times out of 10, I actually have the statistics on this because I have thousands of things that I've got. <laughs> I mean, it is your job, right? To do this, to keep track yes, of things. Yes, like, to be a scientist. <laughs> so I would say um, seven or eight times out of 10, there's some type of faith connection. Mm. There's like for God and country, or yeah. there's a Bible verse, or there's like, you know, Trump is God's chosen one, I hate to say, something like that. Yes. But here's the really interesting thing. Hmm. When when Trump won the first election, not um, what he won, his election, they surveyed people in the exit polls and they said, would you consider yourself to be an evangelical? And of course, the number of evangelicals who voted for Trump was very high. Yeah, 75%, something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So, But then they asked them a very telling question. And this is a question that people use in polling to determine how serious people are, how committed they are to their faith. They've discovered the simple question to ask people is this, and it completely divides the sheep from the goats. How often do you go to church? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the question. And half of the people who call themselves evangelicals who voted for Trump don't even go to church. Yeah. So, so evangelical has become a political term in the United States to the point where, where for most people, their statement of faith is written first by their political ideology and only a very distant second by the Bible. And if the two come into conflict, they will go with politics over the Bible. Yes, that's right. I often tell, um, we often discuss in in my circles that essentially the lens that, that evangelicals use primarily is political first and then the Bible. So yes. they see their polit- political identity as foundational, then they interpret their faith in the Bible through that. And that's what really is, you know, that's part of the, the stew that is now breeding um, a, a rise in Christian nationalism. And you're absolutely mm-hmm. right. The term evangelical is 
it's incredibly broad. I mean, it, it is more of a, of a political identity at this point than it is even a, a faith thing. I'm not sure if you know who, who the Barna group is. Yeah, um, I the, do. The big I do. research company. They wrote a book maybe 10 years ago now, yikes, called Unchristian. And they, they did like, like their polling. And one of the polls that they found was that roughly 75% of Americans claim to have, have a, who claim to have at one point made a prof, uh, professed, you know, faith in Christ moment in their life where they said, yes, I prayed the prayer had this moment, but then they asked people to please uh, see if they would agree with, with the biblical worldview. And they use very broad terms, like so broad that like Mormons, Jehovah witnesses could probably all agree. And only 6% of that 75% agreed. Okay. And this oh is stuff, gosh. and this is stuff that's like, you know, uh, Satan is real, you know, like, <laughs> like, 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 like evil's a thing, you know, the very basic things, but that always stuck with me that, that, that there's a big divide in what people think they're claiming versus mm -hmm. like what they're actually claiming, you know? Yes. Um, and so I kind of find that happening along with the lines of what you just said, where the exit polls, yes, 80% of white evangelicals voted for Trump both years, but as far as how many of them are, are, are church attenders or even take their faith seriously, it, it, it's, that's where it's really hard to know. It's really hard to figure out like what is driving this, you know, but I think one thing that that concerns me um, again, in the circles I'm in is that we definitely see a lot of pastors, self proclaimed prophets, worship mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. who are driving this train mm -hmm. and are attracting a lot of people to have this stew and climate change is one of many things yes. um, that we look at and we go, this is weird. Like what a, what a weird thing to claim to be a Jesus follower and to like, you know, not want to wear a mask or get tested or take climate change seriously, especially because in one of my analogies that I was thinking about with the climate is, you know, if someone, let me, if someone said, Tim, I'm going away for a month, here's my Ferrari, please be a good steward of it. All right. And I take it off roading yeah. and I just, I, I just dump on the thing and I, I eat McDonald's and fries and milkshake. Right. And I bring it back and say, yes. yo, thanks dude. That is not stewarding <laughs> what I was given. Right. Exactly. So, so for us to see, you know, how I would say massive industry, you know, corporate corporatism in general, you know, really pillages um, our planet in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And to be a Christ follower and be like, that, that's totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. No big deal. It's all going to burn. Like it, it doesn't make any sense to me. No, I, it makes I can't, can't no compute. sense. <laughs> Genesis one, God gave us responsibility over every living thing on this planet. You know, revelations, God will destroy those who destroy the earth, <laughs> you know? So how, how do we like, I mean, is there, what do we do with them? What do we do with, with dismissives? Do we just ignore them? Do we fight back? I mean, I don't know how to solve that Rubik's cube. Well, well, first of all, with, with the whole evangelical thing, what, what I think is we've got two completely different types of people who are using the same label. Yeah. So we've got people, Good. one time I asked Leith Anderson when he was the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, and I'd been here in the U.S. for a few years, and I was getting really confused yeah. over all these people calling themselves evangelicals. Right. Look what they were saying. Like, totally. have they not read the Bible? <laughs> right, right. So I asked Leith, I said, how would you define an evangelical? And he said simply, someone who takes the Bible seriously. And I thought to myself, well, that's what I am. And so that is why I'm still calling myself an evangelical. Right. But what I would say is I, I consider myself to be a theological evangelical. Mm. And I that's think good. the term that I would use is political evangelical yeah. for the other ones. I like because that. Because it's really, it's a, it's a, or the CNN evangelical. It's like a demographic, a political yeah. demographic. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a term that sociologists are using today that I think is even more apt. It's um, moral therapeutic deist. And what that is, it's somebody who believes in a God and sort of creates a code of conduct that makes them look good and feel good. Thou shalt always vote Republican. Yes. Thou shalt poo-poo critical race theory and climate change. <laughs> right. Thou shalt not wear a mask or get vaccinated. <laughs> right. That, thou shalt storm the Capitol, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so that's sort of where this is coming from. So I feel like many of us are like, James talks about the man in the mirror where you, you looked at yourself in the mirror and then you went away and you forgot what you look like. Mm. I mean, some people are Christians who've just forgotten what they look like. Some people maybe probably were never Christians. Um, yeah. It's not up to us to judge, right. but that sort of helps, I think, to understand where people are coming from. So, so with dismissives, which I get a lot of on social media and in person too, yes. what I found through trial and error is that um, they they literally can't listen to anything you say. Right. They are, if you give them a link on social media, they are physically incapable of clicking that link and reading it. Mm. 
they will lie about it, like say they did and they didn't. Um, they will, you know, ridicule it and say oh, it was so stupid. I didn't even look at it, but they literally can't process it. Right. And I just gave a talk the other day um, locally at our Lions Club, and there was a man there who was a dismissive. And he literally could not listen to what I was saying because he came up afterwards. He's like, well, what about volcanoes? They produce more. And I was like, sir, I literally said that during my presentation. Didn't you hear me say that? And he's like, no. And I'm like, those were the exact words I said. And it was, it was a short yeah. presentation too. It wasn't like an hour or anything. Like right. we're talking like 15 minutes. Right. So, so dismissives literally can't listen. Like they, they have, you know, invisible fingers in their ears because right. they feel so threatened by this so threatened and fear is at the root of this that they yeah. cannot absorb anything you say so with a dismissive if it's in a public setting with other people listening i respond once so that they know that i have an answer for anybody who's listening hmm. for people who might be doubtful or cautious or disengaged or even right. concerned or alarmed right yeah, I mean, certainly there are people out there, right, that like might say, hey, I, I have honest questions, right? But that's mm -hmm. different than I think what we're seeing in the in those uh, dismissive circles. But yeah, I was just kind of curious to get your thoughts on that, because mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's truly a riddle I'm trying to to solve on my end as well. With like, mm -hmm. mm, you know, like there are some people in my DMs who just want to argue about like how much of a heretic I am. It's like, yeah. I, dude, I, I just don't have all day to, to leave this argument convincing no one. Like, it's just, yeah. I'm not going to change your mind. doesn't matter how many articles, podcasts, proofs, you know, theologies I give you, it ain't going to work. So exactly. So, exactly. Okay, fair enough. Yes. So let's, let's get back a little bit more to the climate change side. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious in your estimation, you know, I, I'm, as I am, what, 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 what we would call deconstructing is like a big term in my circles, you know, kind of mm -hmm. rethinking your faith, renegotiating your faith. As a lot of us are, are in deconstruction, we're realizing how linked all these things are, like how global capitalism and, and global corporatism, it's just so massive. And it's just, it, mm -hmm. it really is a big part of, you know, poverty and oppression is do you see like like um i guess corporatism as like one of the big contributors to climate change because you mentioned earlier that 10 percent of the world's richest are responsible for i think you said 50 percent how do you measure that like 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 what's the data for that yes so that's um that was an oxfam study that i was quoting and what they do is they look at um smaller geographic regions like they look at individual states and they look at how much energy is consumed in the states yeah and they look at what type of cars people drive and how big people's homes are and how much meat they eat and things like that so you add all of that up and you you look at income level and resource use and that's how you determine those types of statistics so it's really interesting because you asked earlier where did this start the roots to what we're seeing today, yeah. they go back mm -hmm. very far. Mm -hmm. The Industrial Revolution was led by a lot of people who were Protestants. So the Protestant work ethic, the whole idea that if you're poor, you're lazy. Yeah. That, that was there early on in the 1800s. Yeah. And there were many Christians, just to be clear, there were very, a lot of theological evangelicals <laughs> and Christians who worked <laughs> very go. hard on poverty eradication, on yes. laws against child labor and child slavery, on, on slavery itself, yep. um, on all those kinds of issues of justice. But, but the idea of uniting our capitalistic society with our theological beliefs, that started a few centuries ago. Yep. Yep. And it accelerated in the United States when the United States separated from from the UK, from England. Mm. Um, there's a classic book that you probably read a long time ago, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind by Mark Knoll. Oh, it's on my book list, but I haven't read it yet. Oh, uh, I, 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 I want him to do an update because it was written in 1992. And I, need, I need an update <laughs> um, because it is just absolutely genius. It explains mm. how when the U.S. detached from the formal churches like the Anglican Church and the Wesleyan Church and the Methodist yeah. Church, when it detached, that sort of led to the uprising of, well, my opinion's as good as yours. Mm. You know, the whole traveling preacher, the whole self-educated man, yes. you know, I'm not going to listen to all those pointy headed people who've been studying how many angels can dance yeah. in the head of a pin right. for hundreds of years. I'm just going to read the Bible and tell people what it says. And that's sort of actually the denomination I grew up in myself, but it was, it was a denomination wide system of checks and balances where often in the U S it was all, it was literally the wild West right. in many ways. Right. And one of them right. was theologically. Mm. And so the whole uh, revivals, the tent meetings, the evangelists, and then along came 
television Mm. and that kicked it into overdrive. Televangelism is really an American thing. And you think about those televangelists, they didn't belong to a structured organization. That's right. They didn't belong to an organization that had any type of theological oversight that had any type of oversight at all. Right. It was just the oversight. They were it. (laughs) They were the lone rangers doing their thing. Totally. And that, that reflects American values very much. Being the lone ranger is seen as a position of strength rather than weakness. Right. So there's this whole intermeshing of culture and religion um, throughout the U.S. And then, then in comes the Seventh-day Adventists, who were the ones who were proposing the whole, like, um, you know, young earth thing. They, they came in from the side and somehow that spread throughout all the Protestant Christianity in the U S yes, it did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. it did. So, so these things go back a long time. Those seeds were planted decades and centuries ago. And I feel like they have come into full flower today. Mm. We are reaping literally what our great, great, great grandparents sowed. Right. So how does that, when it comes to like, you know, things that are affecting climate the most like are we talking about is, is it is it fossil fuels is, is, is that the most important thing to like to tackle like what are some issues that we have to really look at to start at least like trying to offset the damage that we're currently doing yes so 75 percent of the problem is digging up and burning coal and gas and oil and wow. we're still burning a ton of coal today really 75 percent of the problem what is, have you ever heard of the term clean coal? I've heard of this, but I don't know. Does, such a, does that exist? Is, is that a thing? Clean coal? Not really. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, so, so it that's sounds like, nice, you know, it sounds lovely. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yes. Just poof. It blows into little bubbles, you know, like little, yeah. we've, we've also got healthy hamburgers from McDonald's. Those too. <laughs> okay. So, so really fossil fuels are, are their number one on the list of like, if we can, if we can eradicate this and, you know, clean energy, we can really do a lot of good. They're number one. And let me tell you a couple of shocking statistics about fossil fuels. Okay, go ahead. Number one. I'm ready. Two thirds of the carbon emissions since the dawn of the industrial era were produced by 90 corporations. Wow. Nine, nine, zero. Their CEOs could fit into three Greyhound buses. Wow. Or one big plane. Yes. One big plane. 90%. No. Two thirds of the of the carbon emissions. Right. Ninety companies. Ninety companies. Sorry, two thirds. Okay, this is interesting because a lot of times I feel like and you, you mentioned this in the book. The the capitalist society machine likes to tell people, oh, if, if you just you know switch over to to reusable, you'll save yeah. the planet. But in reality, like what we're doing compared to what they're doing, it's like way disproportionate. It totally is, and ah! I think I mentioned this in the book. They have even, BP and Shell, for example, have even invested in advertising campaigns on social media saying, what are you doing to reduce your emissions? You did mention this. I felt so dirty. I'm like, dang it, BP. Victim blaming. (laughs) Yes. And I think I mentioned how the, how the, the, the CEO of BP was like, my daughters are all about the climate, but I say to them, all those people who eat strawberries out of season. And when you go buy new clothes, don't you understand that's part of the problem? Right. And I mean, sure. Those are parts of the problem, but it's literally a drop in the bucket while Shell is pulling, push, you know, throwing bucket fulls in. Right. So, I mean, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Go. Yes. So that is huge. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's a big one. Yeah. So, so then what's the other 25%? The other yeah. 25% is deforestation mm. and agriculture. Specifically, animal agriculture is 14%. So 11% meat. is deforestation and agriculture, and then 14% is meat. And you know what there? I think something like 20 big companies are responsible for half of it. 20 big ag companies, industrial ag, Industrial meat are responsible for half of that. And these are so, like those like big houses, right? Those big, just like mills that are just designed to raise chickens and kill them as soon as possible. It's that, and, that's what you're yes. talking about, right? And, and okay. beef is worse. Beef, beef is worse. a lot worse because it takes a lot of water. It takes a lot of corn. It takes a mm. lot of fossil fuels. And then, and, and the whole idea is, I mean, $1 hamburgers, really? I mean, that, that is just way out of proportion to what that is actually costing us. It's, uh, it's one thing okay. if you're getting like grass fed, you know, steak from a local farm where the cows were grazing on the ground. And as they graze, they actually put carbon back in the soil. You can feed the cows. You can literally give them um, uh, supplements to, to reduce their methane emissions because it's incomplete digestion. 
you know, and we also do the same thing. Like some of our family members. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. I gotcha. I gotcha. So that's where a lot of the emissions come from. And so if you give the cows digestive huh. aids to help them digest their food better, reduces their emissions and you let them graze on the grass and it actually puts carbon back in the soil. So if, if you're talking about that type of meat, that type of meat can be pretty okay, but that type of meat is way expensive compared to the dollar burger that you pick up, which could have come from deforestation in Brazil. You know what I mean? Yes. So again, these things are all linked. It's not just really about, yes, climate change is, is key, but it's also tied to economics. It's tied to, you know, how, how we treat God's planet, how we treat yes. other people. It's all tied together. How we treat animals because industrial farming is not humane. Yeah. No, absolutely. Right. Completely. Okay. So, so you just said two major industries, essentially, you said fossil fuels and, and agriculture are responsible for like the overwhelming majority of the rise in greenhouse gas emissions that we're seeing today. Yes. And deforestation is part of agriculture because why yes. are they burning the forest down? Right. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So then the question obviously is like, what do, what do we do? I mean, yeah, cause, cause exactly. what happens to me is I see that I'm just like, we got to burn the whole thing down, man. You know, like revolutionary, you know, be for vendetta, you know, but obviously change, whether I like it or not happens over time, not instantly, you know, and, and, and certainly um, we, I hope that more Christians start having these conversations about how big corporations and, and really corporate America is destroying so much of the world, you know, and including ec- economies in a lot of way, well, uh, in a lot of ways while they profit. But again, those are conversations. Like, what are actionables? Like, what can I, Tim, in New Jersey, right? Like, what can me, little old me, do besides using paper straws instead of plastic straws? Like, what else can I do? Exactly. And so that's the thing, because we're we are being told yeah. that we need to, well, first of all, we're being told we need to change our light bulbs and recycle. And right. we know instinctively that is not going to fix the greatest challenge facing us today. As right. I mean, I've done it, but still like, yes, and I've done it too. Just to be clear, I have done it. You've done it. Yes. Right, we've done right. it because it's the right thing to do, Right. but right. that's not going to change the world. Right. Then we're also being told that all the solutions are negative. There's a large sort of Puritan ethos of martyrdom to the, the, the kind of climate crowd. I like the way you talk, Catherine, that's spot on. (laughs) If you're not suffering, you're not a true, you're not in the cause. Right. Right. So we have to not, it's all about not, it's all about stopping. You have to stop driving. Right. Stop flying, stop having children, stop having meat, right. Stop using electricity. Basically everything except stopping breathing because when you put, breathe, put all your waste in here. <laughs> yes. I, oh yeah. That too. Put all your waste in there. Yes. Yes. Now don't get me wrong. I admire people who can do that. I follow Same. a few of them on Instagram and I'm just like mesmerized. Right. But I got a one year old though. I, I got a kid and he poops right. a lot, you know, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out you're like cloth diapers, regular diapers, <laughs> you get recycled diapers, but then you have to wash the cloth ones. And then, but I mean, it Guilty. is a losing. <laughs> yes. It's a losing game. Right. 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 And it's all designed to make us feel guilty and inadequate. It's a new set of green 10 commandments and it does, but you know what? Guilt and fear ultimately paralyzes us. We just Mm. give up. We feel like I have tried as hard as I could. I have literally done everything I could and it wasn't enough um, that, you know, that we're not turning this train around and I quit or I just fall over the edge into despair and fear and anxiety and, and guilt. Right. And I see this happening. I see this happening with people every single day. Yeah. And so what's the answer? Right. Well, the, the answer is to look at how the world has changed before. Hmm. And what's really fascinating is that when you look at how, how do we overcome slavery? Right. It wasn't because a small handful of very dedicated people decided to free their slaves and then that's it. Hmm. If that was what had happened, there would have been some free slaves and nothing would have changed. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But what did they do? Sure, they lived out their values. I mean, you can't be a slaveholder and advocate for the end of slavery. Right. Well, most, most people can't. A few people actually did, unfortunately. Good point. Yes, good point. Won't yes. mention Thomas Jefferson, but maybe he might have be included in that. <laughs> might or might not be, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Anyways, yeah. most people um, realize that you can't be a hypocrite. You can't, you know, go owning slaves where you're advocating for the end of slavery. Right. But they knew that that wasn't enough. Right. So what did they do? They weren't. In the beginning, they weren't members of parliament. They certainly weren't King George. They weren't, you know, big, famous, rich people. They were ordinary people, many of them Christians, 
you know, that William Wilberforce movie is one of my favorite movies, who decided based on the strength of their convictions, the world had to change, it must change because it was not just, it was not fair. And motivated by God's love, they raised their voices to go out and to talk to other people about it. Mm. And then those people connected with other people. And then they started forming groups of people who talked about it. And then they started talking to people to make decisions. They started talking to other landowners who owned slaves. They started talking to members of parliament who could who could introduce bills. They right. started talking to other members of parliament saying, would you vote on this bill if it's introduced. They started talking to decision makers. They started talking to people who had the clout to make the big changes. Right. How did things change? It was because people used their voices to advocate for change. Mm. Look at women getting the vote. Look at the civil rights movement in the United States. Who were the names we remember? They mm. were not famous people before. Mm. They became well known. And for the few names that we know, there are hundreds that we do not know at all. 100%. That's but right. they were totally just as much part of this yes, as, right. you know, the Pankhursts and the Martin Luther uh, kings of the world. Yeah. They used their voices to advocate for change. And of course, yeah. they lived out their values, but they knew that that wasn't what changed the world. What yeah. changed the world is when you go to the back of the or the front of the bus and you just sit there. Mm -hmm. And everybody sees you sitting there. What changes the world is when you, you know, you follow Tear Fund or World Vision or the Evangelical Environmental Network or Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, and you get some of the materials in social media and you post it on your social media account so other mm -hmm. people see it. Mm -hmm. Use your voice in your church, in your school, in your place of work, in your neighborhood, in your kids' school, in whatever organization you're part of. Use your voice to talk about two things, about why this matters to us here and now, not the polar bears over there, but us here right? and what we can do and what is already being done to help fix it. So people mm. realize it is solvable. That boulder is not like I talk about in the book. It's not at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it. It is already at the top of the hill. It already has millions of hands on it. And you know what? A lot of those hands are evangelical Christians, mm. believe it or not. Yeah. And we are pushing that boulder down the hill as fast as we can. We just need more hands to help it go faster. Mm. That's how we get people on board. <sighs> That's a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's helpful. I, I, I think it also, I think what, what can fuel the hopelessness is because we're such an individualist uh, society. We feel like it's all on us or nothing. Like, like the idea of yes. like being part of a collective is just kind of foreign to us a lot of times. Right. Totally. But the reality is if we can remember that we're better together <laughs> and that we can get changes done when we're working together, even if, um, you know, we, we, we don't all agree on all the details. The fact yeah. is when we're moving in one direction together with different schools of thought, uh, that that's a movement, right? And I, I'm pulling from, I forgot her name. It's, it's a, it was a, a civil rights activist who said that she said, when you have a group of people in diversity of thought moving in one direction, that's a movement. When you have a group of people moving with the same thought, in the same direction. That's a cult. And I'm yeah. like, I love that. I love that so much. Right. So I, I, yes. yeah, I think that's really good. Well, listen, I appreciate you making time. We're at the hour mark already. I want to respect your time. Obviously I feel like we can talk about so many more things. And if, if, if it ever works out, we'd love to get you back on the show. Um, yes. your book, I'd love to come. great. Your book is saving us a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. When's the, when does this, this book come out? It's out September 21st, um, hardcover, Kindle, audible book that I actually read myself. I uh, love audible books. They're my yes. favorite. Okay. And the book is full of stories. So if you're listening to this and you're like, well, what am I supposed to say? That's the book is just packed with stories that you can read about and share, right? Yes. And Oh, hold on. Something crashed out on me. Don't move. Died. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, my computer crashed out. That's weird. All right. Um, so I was going to say before we, we, we get ready to go, I have read this book and I totally agree with you. The book is, it's really, it's very digestible for the average person. Like I'm, I'm no scientist and there's no big words here. I'm a homeschooler. I understood and comprehended it. You know, like it was a really well-written book. I really enjoyed it. So I'll definitely make sure I put a link in the show notes. This, by the time this recording's out, the book will probably be out by now. So, which yeah, is super I think exciting. So, so yes. I'll put it in my show notes, but again, Catherine, thank you for coming on. I, I loved our time together. Thank you. Thank you for having me.